The trail of the Third Army and the 19th Tactical Air Command of the 8th Air Force is marked by more than 40,000 white crosses. 40,000 dead Americans. <laughs> We were young and soldiers called to dedicate our lives In the name of God and country Do what's just for us, go do what's right A hot band of brothers Waiting on our chance To add one more page unto the victory game here am I, Lord, send me, send me. Victory lies in the spirit of the lives of the men who died for me. Then I heard the voice of the Lord say, Whom shall I send? And who will go? Here am I. Send me. This is Michael Brother, Marine Corps veteran, actor, and Gallant Crew board member. You are listening to the new American Veteran on Vets on Media. Now here's Carl Monger. Hey, good afternoon. Today is April the 9th. That sounds awfully loud there. Today is April the 9th. Thank you for joining the New American Veteran on Vets on Media. I am your host, Carl Monger, the founder of Gallant Few, and I am proud to be an American veteran. Thank you for listening today. I'm taking a chance. I didn't put the dogs out, so uh, if anybody comes and knocks on the door of the studio, we may get a little excitement around here. Um, this program is dedicated to those who said, here am I, send me, and we honor our veterans, celebrate those who have succeeded in their civilian careers, and identify areas and resources that help veterans leverage their military experience into successful and rewarding lives after the military. If you're on Facebook, uh, go find the New American Veteran Internet Radio Talk Show. That's a long name for a Facebook page. And uh, I'm going to try and keep an eye on it. You can chat me a question there through the comment section. I posted one that said, are you listening to the show today? Uh, ask a question. So watch that. Uh, I will try and keep an eye out over there, but I am multitasking today because I'm the show producer, I'm the show host, and uh, the soundboard controller and everything else all at once. I do want to say our hearts go out to those killed and injured at the Fort Hood shooting last week. We're horrified at what happened and very disappointed at how quickly the media pointed at post-traumatic stress disorder as the cause. There is much education to do. And uh, next week we plan, or the week after next, excuse me, two weeks from today, we should be able to bring on the founder and executive director of Invisible Wounds so that we can talk about her work with post-traumatic stress and her experience also as a caregiver. Today's program is dedicated to Sergeant Patrick Hawkins and Specialist Cody Patterson of the 3rd Ranger Battalion. Yesterday they were posthumously awarded the Bronze Star with V-Device and also to Specialist Samuel Ray Crockett, an IED specialist who received the Silver Star for heroism in saving Ranger lives and clearing explosives. Bear with me while I read this account and note the combined forces at play. Not all of them were rangers and not all of them were men. Six months after they were killed by an IED in Kandahar, Afghanistan, Sergeant Patrick C. Hawkins and Specialist Cody J. Patterson of the 3rd Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment were posthumously awarded the Bronze Star with Valor Device during a combat awards ceremony Tuesday at Fort Benning. Major General H. R. McMaster, commander of the Maneuver Center of Excellence, also presented a Silver Star, the third highest military decoration for valor, 10 other Bronze Stars, 33 Purple Hearts, and 18 Army Commendations with Valor Device for the Rangers' actions between October the 20th and December the 17th. During the period, the battalion conducted more than 140 missions that killed or captured 250 enemy insurgents and leaders. See, now this is an aside here. When I talk about the, the, the likelihood of a ranger having symptoms of post-traumatic stress, it's because the frequency, the intensity, and the duration of their exposure to that trauma ramps up. It ratchets up the possibility that they might develop post-traumatic stress. I mean, it's just natural when you think about all the things they're exposed to and that they see and that they do. Um, 
Hawkins, 25 of Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and Patterson, 24 of Philomath, Oregon, were going to aid eight rangers when they were killed October the 5th. The soldiers, who were aware of other possible roadside bombs, entered the area to evacuate the wounded to a medevac helicopter on the ground. These rangers sacrificed themselves in an attempt to provide aid to wounded members of their assault force in dire circumstances, the, the citation stated. Special Samuel Ray Crockett was awarded the Silver Star for his actions on October the 5th when an assault team encountered multiple roadside bombs while searching for a Taliban network leader. Eight members of the strike force were injured after three IED, uh, three IED devices went off. Janney, a multi-purpose canine, was sent after a fleeing insurgent hiding in vegetated terrain when the enemy detonated a suicide vest, killing himself and that canine. First Lieutenant Jennifer M. Moreno, 25 years old, assigned to Madigan Army Medical Center at Joint Base Lewis McCord, Washington, went to aid a wounded soldier when she triggered an IED and uh, was killed instantly. Moments later, Patterson stepped on a similar device. He and Hawkins were mortally wounded. Special Agent Joseph M. Peters, assigned to the 286th Military Police Detachment in Vicenza, Italy, was the fourth soldier killed as he triggered two more devices. After the roadside bomb detonated and left a ranger's right leg amputated, Crockett rendered aid to the wounded soldier and cleared a path for the helicopter landing zone to recover casualties and equipment from the battlefield. He was responsible for recovering the body of Moreno. Despite the imminent danger inherent to maneuvering through the IED belt, Specialist Crockett repeatedly elected to enter uncleared areas and in the process recovered 14 total personnel, the citation stated. Bronze Stars were presented to Sergeant First Class Morada Tedesco, Sergeant First Class Kerry Wirtz II, Specialist Logan Howard, Senior Airman Tristan Wendell, Staff Sergeant Aaron Arnold, Staff Sergeant Ryan Flora, Staff Sergeant Richard Cessna, Staff Sergeant Keelan Horton, Staff Sergeant Zachary Skinner, and Corporal Joshua Hargis. <laughs> Hargis, excuse me, I know that name, but it's misspelled here in the press release. The Rangers were cited for helping to recover wounded soldiers from the battlefield and to clear the area of explosives. Arnold of Medway, Ohio, said the challenge shows what soldiers are made of as Rangers. I was proud to see all my other brothers up there, said Arnold, a recipient of the Purple Heart and a, and a Bronze Star. I'm happy to be in such a great organization, proud to serve with fellow Rangers. Now, I thought it was really important to start the show off and talk about that because the team that was there, you have a female from Madigan Army Medical Center, you have a canine, <clears throat> excuse me, and a, and a canine dog handler had to be there. You had a special agent from a military police unit. You had other folks that they don't talk about that are plugged into this task force because they're going out there, they're finding where the bad guys are, and they're taking the fight right to them 250 times in that deployment. And, and that 250 times, back in my day, 20 years ago when I was back in the Army, um, for us to do one raid like they're doing 250 times in a 90-day rotation, that one raid, we would have rehearsed for it two weeks ahead of time, and then we would have gone through it maybe four or five times that day before we're ready to actually go execute the doggone thing. I mean, you think about all of that preparation that it took for us to be able to do what they're knocking off 250 times in 90 days. You do the math, that's more than one raid a night. That is an incredible pace of operations. All right, I have a couple of quick more announcements, and then I will dial in and bring on my first guest, the Raider Project. We now have a, a website that is live that's called RaiderProject.org, R-A-I-D-E-R Project.org. Uh, the Raider Project is, you know, when I started the, the Rangers Mentoring Rangers program, we named it the Darby Project in honor of General Darby from World War II and the impact that his legacy had on the entire military uh, starting all the way back in 1942. Uh, the Raider Project mimics what we're doing in terms of mentoring one-on-one -on -one by similar veterans for similar veterans. So when you think about it, uh, Rangers have tremendous respect for Marines, as do Marines for Rangers, I think. Uh, but if I connect a Ranger that lives in, I don't know, Topeka, Kansas, with uh, a Marine that is moving to Topeka, Kansas, you know, they might get together once in a while, have a beer, a cup of coffee, and do a little bit of light networking. But it's nothing like if there's a Marine in Topeka, Kansas, that welcomes home another Marine to Topeka, Kansas, because that bond is immediate, it is intense, and it is, it is, you, you can't break it. Even if they served in the Marine Corps 20 years apart, They've been to the same places. They've been through the same training. They're going to have a mutual level of respect for each other. 
And that now is what the Raider Project is doing. The Raider Project has a special focus on MARSOC, Marine Special Operations, uh, as does the Darby Project with Rangers from the 75th Ranger Regiment. However, the Raider Project also encompasses all of the warfighter Marines. So when you think about anybody that's been out there putting themselves in danger, carrying a, a weapon, taking the fight to the enemy, that's who the Raider Project on the Marine Corps side is going to help. So uh, go check that out, RaiderProject.org. It is going to be led by, it is being led by, uh, Marine Corps Special Operations veteran uh, Nick Kamalatsos. And uh, he has already done a fantastic job putting the website together and operationally some of the other things that he is doing to secure support and to get uh, more Marine, uh, Marine Corps volunteers out there that are ready to help. Uh, I want to uh, say congratulations to the, the nominees who have been voted for induction in this year's Ranger Hall of Fame. And uh, the induction ceremony is going to be the 16th of July, 2014, so a little ways off yet. But l let me tell you these names, and I know several of these. Sergeant Major Peter Becerra, M Master Sergeant Kenneth Bachman, Lieutenant General Del Daly, Command Sergeant Major James Fowler, Command Sergeant Major Jeffrey Greer, Colonel Robert Guy, Lieutenant General John Lemoyne, Brigadier General Herbert Lloyd, Staff Sergeant Calvin Rollins, and Colonel Robert Tonsetic. Uh, that message came from Staff Sergeant Nathan Rodeheaver, the 75th Ranger Regiment, RS-9, NCOIC. I have no idea what RS, let's see, there was one through five when I was there. So RS-6, I think, has something to do with maybe computers, but RS-7, RS-8, uh, RS-9, I have no idea. That um, That's graduated far beyond my knowledge of those. All right, I got one more thing that I want to say here, and... Uh, you know, I did not. I was going to pop this picture out so we could look at it, but I didn't do it, so you're just going to have to hear me talk about it. Um, you may have heard, seen on the news here a couple of days ago, that Mickey Rooney passed away. And Mickey Rooney was a famous child star, you know, cute as a button, and then he starred with Judy Garland in a movie where he sang really well. And um, You probably did not know that he was a veteran of service in the U.S. Army. Not only was he a veteran of service in the U.S. Army, but this is after he was a famous actor. He joined the Army in 1944, after he was a famous actor, and he served for 21 months. Mickey was famous for his Jeep shows, where he would ride along the front lines in World War II to entertain the troops. He also entertained troops in Korea and was a longtime member of the American Legion. So, Mickey Rooney, we honor and we thank you for your service. And uh, go look up, read a little bit about him, because it's pretty darn cool. Uh, U.S. Army Special Forces veteran and Ranger Tim Kennedy fights Michael Bisbing next week, April 16th, live on Fox Sports. Uh, I would like to try and mimic the announcer uh, saying that uh, we're getting ready to fight, but I probably have all kinds of uh, legal people getting mad at me because of that. What's cool about this is it is not pay-per-view, so that means anybody can watch it. You don't, uh, as long as you got Fox Sports, you can watch it. And even if you don't, I think you can probably pull it up online and watch it on the internet. So. Uh, Dial in, tune in, whatever you need to do to watch Tim Kennedy fight Michael Bisbing. You know, the the uh, Ranger Up camp has had kind of a long-standing poke fun at Michael Bisbing's camp, and there are some hilarious videos that are out there. And uh, it's going to be a pretty intense fight, I think, because there is a little bit of bad blood between the two. But there is a piece that was done on Tim Kennedy that talks about his military service and his fighting career, and it is phenomenal. If you have not seen it, go look for it. I will post it on the Gallant Few Blogspot article, uh, which brings me to my last um, thing I'm going to talk about before I bring on my guest here, and that is uh, gallantfew.blogspot.com, the companion written blog to this uh, talk show is Gallant Few blogspot.com, or if you go to blogger.com and you search for Gallant Few, or if you go to gallantview.org, go to the bottom. I think you'll find a link there for it. If not, there will be one there very soon. Um, we post a lot of very inf informative, critical, time-sensitive, uh, interesting, compelling, whatever you want to call it, content on that blog, and, and it is driven specifically towards veteran transition issues and things of interest to veterans. Uh, for instance, I saw an article a couple of days ago about uh, Jill Stevenson, who is the mother to uh, Ranger Ben Cop, who was killed in action. And, uh, and she had spoken with a group of 
elementary school kids. And then elementary school kids subsequently, she actually spoke to a group of Cub Scouts. But after that, uh, one of the kids had an assignment in school to write about what is a hero to you. And he picked Ben Cop because of what Jill had said. And he wrote uh, a, a very... Uh, very, I don't want to say emotional because that's not the right term, but it was a piece that honored Ben Cop that that clearly showed that Cop has continued through even through his death to impact the lives of others. There's a whole backstory behind him. His heart was transplanted into a woman, uh, and and there's an article about the heart of a ranger that beats on. I mean, it's just it's awesome. You want to read it? You want to find the links? Go to gallifu.blogspot.com and you'll find that there. Uh, the other thing that happened is here about a week ago was the uh, 20th anniversary, 20th anniversary? How about 10th anniversary of the Jessica Link rescue operation? And that was a pretty uh, pretty phenomenal event, and not a whole lot of people know the whole story. You, you just hear what the media wants you to hear. Uh, we wrote about that too, and I pulled, there's there's a video link that shows some of the actual rescue of Jessica Lynch, and, and when you see you hear gunfire in the distance and you see her squeal and her reaction to that. Uh, she was not being well taken care of. She was in terror. She was absolutely terrified of what was going to happen. And and the men that subsequently went in the courtyard of that hospital and dug up the bodies of fallen American soldiers, men and women with their bare hands because they didn't bring any entrenching tools with them. That story is kind of lost to history, but it is an absolute and amazing story. So one of those Rangers, one of those Rangers, uh, after he got back from one of his deployments, he disregarded the advice of his friends and he drove while he was drunk. And uh, and it forever changed his life. And I forgot to play this last week. I'm going to make sure that I play it now. So uh, this, is, uh, this is Ranger Bemis. What do you stand to lose when you make the choice to drink and drive? Your career the people that you love the most, your ability to walk, your ability to use your hands. The list goes on and on. What do you stand to gain when you make the choice to not drink and drive? You stand to gain everything. I made the choice to drink and drive, and that's some of the things I lost. Learn from my mistakes. Make the right choice. Don't drink and drive. Rangers lead the way. Gallant Fuse, the new American veteran, is proud to be part of the Vets on Media Network. Yeah, that was pretty cool the way that worked out, wasn't it? Uh, Adam, I hope you're listening. I hope you're proud of me. All right, now I'm going to uh, I'm going to call up Dr. Uh, Dr. Shores, Dr. Jacob Shores is uh, works for Carrick Brain Centers. This is a multidisciplinary brain center that combines evidence-based diagnostics with leading-edge technologies and treatments to help improve the quality of life of patients suffering from brain injuries. Uh, let me see if I can get Dr. Shores on the line here. Hello? Uh, hello, Dr. Shores, please. Hi, Carl Monger, uh, Gallant Few, the New American Veteran. You are live and on the air. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. It's a it's a gorgeous day. Uh, I've had a great day so far, and uh, it's only getting better. So I appreciate you being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. So right before I called you, um, well, I was starting to, to talk a little bit about Carrick Brain Center, multidisciplinary brain center with evidence-based diagnostics. And uh, you do a lot of work with professional athletes. You do work with uh, just normal, everyday people that have brain injuries, and you also work with soldiers and veterans. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, the, maybe what you do and how you got into doing this? While you do that, I'm going to sure. see if I can pop a picture of you up on the screen. Okay. Well, what we do is we take kind of a unique approach uh, and look more at the functional aspects of the brain and how, how different parts of the brain integrate together uh, 
to try and increase the quality of life by getting the the, out, the global output of someone's brain to the highest level that we possibly can. And what we do is when a patient comes in, regardless to their background, um, is they come in, we always have intake forms just like everybody else does, but then we do diagnostics that are a little bit different. We look at eye movements and we look at posturography, which is kind of like some, some more advanced balance testing. And we also do a physical exam. And the reason we look so heavily at some of those things are because we can get a lot of good information about different parts of the brain and how they're working, as well as the integration of all those parts based on eye movements, as well as balance and different tests with balance. So we know what normal looks like. And when we see something other than that, we know exactly where in the brain it's coming from. And we can develop specific strategies to activate and stimulate specifically those parts of the brain to try and get the overall output to be better. I'm glad you mentioned. I'm glad you mentioned. You know what normal looks like because one of the things that, and after this, I'm going to bring on a sergeant first class from the army with a traumatic brain injury, and and I've known him for a while. He's going to talk about what he's been through. But uh, when you look at somebody with a traumatic brain injury, you can't tell that they have a traumatic brain injury. Not always. Well, well, yeah. If, if there's somebody that's that's obviously had, if you see the scarring or or, but I mean, you could look at somebody like a professional football player. Uh, sure. You look at them and and they look healthy. They look like they're good to go. And but what's going on? What I guess maybe backing up just a little bit. How much of a injury or a or a blow does it take to cause a traumatic brain injury? And then. How do people say, oh, I think I've got a traumatic brain injury. I need to go in and see the care folks. Okay, well, uh, well, there's different there's different TBI, a traumatic brain injury. There's panel TBI, which is kind of more on the concussion end. Okay, and then there's some more significant, like a car wreck where somebody is not wearing a seatbelt and they, go, they get ejected from the vehicle or they hit their head on the windshield and, you know, it's, and they have a bleed or something. So there's different classifications. But the thing is, is what you're describing more fits in the category of a, a mild traumatic brain injury, like closer to the concussion end or like a blast injury, you know, that didn't do hard structural damage. But, and and to, give you an, to give you an example of something that might fit in that category, there, there's this thing in the Army that's called um, the, the, well, 20 years ago we called it the Ranger Anti-Armor Weapon System, but it's designed, it's a Swedish Anti-Armor Weapon System that you you can only fire like two of them in a 24 hour period because the overpressure is so great that it might really mess you up. And I, I laid about three feet away from a gunner that fired one several times and it, it physically felt like I was, and I'm laying flat on the ground, lifted up about an inch and set back down, but all the air was gone. I couldn't breathe for a good 10 seconds. And that, that blast wave that hits you, is something like that enough to cause a mild TBI, or does it really need to be something that that you know, hey, I, my bell just got rung, I really have a brain injury? Well, it, it certainly can. And the thing is, is when you pile repeated events like that on top of each other, especially in a close period of time, is it, it adds up. And it doesn't, you know what I mean, it's not a linear type deal. Is it, is it kind of multiplies the more you get which can make the whole situation worse and worse and worse. Yeah, I'm great. So, <laughs> I mean, that's the sad reality of it, you know, which is why we see so many of the, of the vets coming back who are, unfortunately, in such a rough shape, you know, because they're out there, they're doing their job, and they're doing what they have to, and it's, you know, it comes at a price. When, and you can't tell. When, when you look at them, you can't, unless they're bleeding from the ears or, their eyes are crossed all of a sudden. You, you just can't tell that they really have a traumatic brain injury. No, exactly. And some of these guys, when you do imaging on them, say you do an MRI or a CT or something like that, you get you get some good pictures of their brain and everything comes back quote-unquote normal anatomically, but they are having significant symptoms that they can't sleep anymore, they're irritable, they're depressed, they have anxiety, you know, they their light and sound sensitive, their memory is terrible. But if you get if you look at imaging, they're considered normal, hmm. which is really the misconceiving thing about it. So uh, I'm really glad that you know traumatic brain injury is starting to get the attention it really deserves. Okay, so if you can't, if you don't see the damage when you do an MRI or the imaging, how then? How do you diagnose it? How do you find out that somebody has a traumatic brain injury and to the extent of it? Okay, so. 
what an MRI or some other form of imaging is going to show, I mean, unless it's a functional MRI, which is a whole different thing, which is a great tool, but if the anatomy is still intact, which means like a piece of shrapnel or something didn't go in and sever anything, it's more of a functional or a chemical lesion or an injury, okay? So what happens is that part of the brain, while structurally it is still intact, it is not operating the way it's on a chemical basis. Mm -hmm. So we use more functional testing, like we test eye movements, we test gait, which is, you know, just walking. We see how you move, we see your balance and your posture, and we can get a really good picture of what your brain looks like physiologically or functionally than we do. Because a lot of times that will tell a very different story than just hard imaging. Yeah, and I saw, I got the chance to tour the Brain Center here a couple of weeks ago, and, and I saw a couple of the tests that you do, and one of them uh, is the a balance plate that you stand on. Can you talk a little bit about what that does, how, how that helps you identify what's going on? Sure. So there are three systems that we use for balance primarily. Okay, we use our visual system so that we can see with our eyes whether something is moving in the world or whether we're moving, and we can kind of adjust from there. We also use what's called the somatos, which is kind of all the input that we get from our muscles and our joints that tell our brain where we are in space and if something's moving or if we're moving. And then we use the vestibular system, which is your inner ear and that balance mechanism. Mm -hmm. So the, the testing equipment that you saw, we can actually isolate each one of those three systems and test how well it's functioning. So we, we know exactly which one's not doing the job, and sometimes what happens is you can have skews in all three, or even just in one. And what happens is your brain is receiving different information from each of those systems. So it's kind of like three siblings who are all fighting for, for mom or dad's attention, and your brain has to kind of fight with all of them to figure out which one's right. Well, and as, especially, times. yeah, that, that's what I was just going to say. If, there, if the signals are coming in mixed or distorted, exactly. now you've got a fight going on about who's going to win. It's a sensory mismatch, which can turn your world upside down as you're experiencing it. Hmm. So the beautiful thing about that is we literally have, we have the medical research gold standard posturography or balance testing that we can use to isolate each of those three systems. And it gives us really good information about how somebody's brain and other parts of their nervous system are working based on performance in those specific areas. Now, is this a brand new thing that, that we know this about the brain and the injuries and how to diagnose it, or is this something that's been developed here very recently? Well, it's it's been around for some time. It's a, some of it is a different train of thought or a different style of thinking, where it's, it's more based on a functional approach and how a person's brain actually is working and if they're putting out, mm -hmm. the brain should or not, versus just looking at diagnostic imaging and saying, oh, well, your MRI is fine, you're normal, go back to, you know, here's something for your headaches and go sit in a dark room for two weeks and everything will be fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, which, which sometimes does work, don't get me wrong, but more often than not, that doesn't do the trick. Okay, so once you have once you've identified that, then what's the next step to to trying? I mean, you know that you've got the damage in the brain. Then what happens? Yes, and the beautiful thing is when we can localize very specifically exactly where in the brain the issue is, we can develop strategies to just activate those parts. Because if, say you have an assembly line, if you have four different components in that assembly line, like just like a pathway in your brain and one of those parts is doing 25% of the job that it should. When you pump all four of those parts up, like even though all of them are going to be functioning at a higher level, you still have that one part of the assembly line, or that one part of your brain, mm -hmm. that is putting out 75% less than all the others. So that asymmetry is still there. So you really need to target just that one part that's not the job. So we develop strategies to go after just that specific part or those specific parts in each individual. So how do you do that? Okay, so we can use some eye exercises, we can use vestibular rehabilitation, we can use good old-fashioned physical rehabilitation, and we can use 
certain electrical stimulation that we can plug right into somebody's brain stem. I finally figured out how to put your picture up on the screen here, so I think we got you. Good. Okay. (laughs) I hope it's a good one. Multitask. Hey, it's the official uh, PR photo that you sent over, so. Okay, perfect. Approved for release. Um, Yeah. (laughs) So, so for instance, let's talk about getting back to that balance plate issue or or, uh, instance, because I was really, I I got to see the results of a test on that, and Mm -hmm. can you kind of talk about what the, when you stand on that balance plate and you're looking at a display and you're trying to do different things with with your feet, you know, your balance as you're moving, how does that identify areas of your brain that there might be a problem and then how do you counteract that to try to help recover? Okay, so what we do is depending on where someone's center of gravity is or the center of pressure, as we actually see it come up on the diagnostics and also through our physical exam, is we can develop different strategies in order to try and shift that because we know certain certain proclivities or certain excuse me, certain trends if somebody has an anterior center of gravity or they're actually as they think they are standing up perfectly straight, they're either leaning forward or leaning backwards, but they have no idea. Well, yeah, and, and an example of that is somebody that's got a brain injury, or a brain injury, I'm sorry, back injury, you think you're standing up straight, but you're really kind of stooped over a little bit. Yeah. So that's sure. kind of an example of that. But with a brain injury, you think you're standing up straight, but you really might be kind of canned off to the left or right or front or back. Absolutely. And you'll never know it because it's more of a reflexive, kind of a subconscious type deal that you're not really aware of because you perceive that you are standing up straight. And the reason you perceive that because different parts of your brain, which we can isolate, are not sending the right signals to actually get you to that neutral position where somebody should be. Hmm. Okay, so we can see it like with if somebody's frontal lobes, uh, the big exec, the front executive function parts that kind of gives us our personality and helps us to, you know, interact and deal with it. It, it plays a role in depression and anxiety and memory. It, it gives us our personality, kind of makes us who we are, right? So. When we see somebody who has frontal demise, that can cause a shift in their center of pressure, sometimes forward, sometimes back. Hmm. Okay? So if we see someone with a lesion in their cerebellum, which is kind of that, that the ball that hangs off the back of your brain, mm-hmm. and, and it's really involved in coordination, if we see something wrong with that, that can also shift you know, side to side or front or back, depending on where in that part of your brain the injury is. So we use all of our modalities along with our physical exam in order to really figure out where the issue is, and then we have to come up with a strategy to specifically target that part so that we can shift somebody back towards neutral. And the reason that that kind of stuff is so important yeah. is because we know that when we shift somebody's balance more towards neutral, it means those parts of their brain are functioning better, and we can correlate that to, say, it's their frontal lobe that is, you know, wasn't putting out the way it should. When we get their balance back online as we fix their frontal lobes, we can correlate that with, you know, an increase in affect or the way they're feeling, a decrease in depression. We can correlate that to, you know, oftentimes better memory, better posture, which can also help relieve some of the pain. Because if you think about it, if someone has an anterior center of gravity, what happens is all the muscles that are on you know, the bigger muscles in their back and sometimes their hamstrings will be contracted and really tight to try and reflectively pull them back to neutral. Mm-hmm. So if somebody's really having some significant low back pain but they have an anterior center of pressure and we can shift them back, a lot of times we and which can reduce their pain. Yeah, and uh, we have somebody that is slightly off balance like that. They could be... Everything in their body is working to try to correct that. The brain's working over time. The muscles in the body are over. And then it's no wonder that people are, like you said, that they're tired or they're having trouble sleeping because all these things feed into that total body. Absolutely. Um, how, how does, when you have them do different exercise balance and those kinds of things, how does that make the brain recover? Because once the brain is damaged, isn't the brain just damaged? Well, it, if it's, a structural or a hard lesion where a nerve is severed or, you know, part of their brain was removed, 
then sometimes it gets a little trickier and we can try and rewire other parts of the brain to take over, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Those hard lesions or ablative lesions are called are, are tougher. So as long as it's not that and it's more of a functional or a physiological, a chemical lesion where it's just not working the way it should, we we have those with you know with just all the different therapies that we use. Mm-hmm. So it, it's not one of those. It's depending on the cause. The brain, when there's an issue with it, is it's not always permanent. Most of the times, with physiological lesions, are just those the functional issues that they're having. When there's no anatomical disturbance, we we tend to have a really good success rate with that wow. because of the specificity and the individuality of the treatment plans that we come up with for each patient. Now, is does it make a difference how long from injury to start a treatment? Is is um, I mean, if somebody had a brain injury two years ago and they start treatment with you next week, uh, are they going to have as great a level of success as if they got injured last week and started with you next week? Well, <laughs> you know, that's a really good question. And the thing is, is oftentimes, you know, you'll see – Let's, let's talk specifically about concussion or blast injury or something. Mm-hmm. There's no anatomical changes, okay? Is you have to wait a certain period for the chemistry of the brain just to reset. Hmm. So oftentimes people will go and they'll say, okay, just wait two weeks and things should get better. Okay, so we know that it takes anywhere from two to four weeks for the actual brain chemistry to reset itself, okay? Now, that doesn't always come with a return to normal function, which is where we really come in. Okay, so we have to wait that period for the chemistry to reset because if you if you treat somebody during that period, it can actually be harmful. Okay, so once it's safe and everything's stable, then we can get going. And generally, you will see, a, you know, a better success rate or, or back a little quicker if it's a more fresh injury. But but conversely, yeah. if if you get that injury and then you don't let the brain reset, and within a day or two, you have another injury. That's when you're, like you were talking earlier, it's like the Richter scale where scale one is one, scale two is not one plus one, scale two is like one a hundred times. So it, it, Exactly. Yeah. There's always that potential. Now, that isn't to say that somebody who had an injury 15 or 20 years ago, you know, is short on luck, right? It, uh, we can do, yeah, too bad. We have, a, we have very good success rates with people who've had traumatic brain injuries from, I think the oldest one that we've treated is probably 30 years. Wow. And we did, we did pretty well with it. Okay, so... Um, necessarily, sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's not. And it's still individualized and it's hard to say. But overall, the sooner we can see you, the more optimistic we are about the outcome. Now, how at Carrick Brain Centers, it, your website is what? Uh, www dot carrickbraincenters dot com c a r r i c k braincenters dot com and uh, there's one in Dallas there's one in Atlanta is that correct yes sir and and if somebody out there has a traumatic brain injury how do they get access to you do they have to go see their primary physician and get referred do they call you up and see if they can get in how does how would somebody just the best way to do it is to call us and our phone number here is two one four Seven seven one eight 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 five two one four seven seven one eight 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 five. Now I'm not writing that down, but if you would uh, email that to me, when we get off the call. Then yes, I'll make sure when I post the blog, and I'll put it in comments in this how where what your website is as well as how to call. Beautiful. I will happily do that. Is this something that normal insurance covers, or is, or is somebody going to have to pay out of pocket? Somebody. Right now, we are cash. We are actually working with some insurance companies to start getting it covered so that we can get more people who really need our help. Yeah, and that's because it's it's a fairly new technique, correct? We're, we're, uh, and, and the thing is, is we, we view things in somewhat of a different way. And the thing is, is we don't go and develop a treatment plan and then just carry it out you know, indefinitely. What we do is we really like to test And then we come up with a treatment plan, and we enact that treatment plan, and then we retest frequently to make sure we're doing exactly what we want to do and we're heading in the right direction. And then if if things aren't going the way we want, then we'll change the treatment plan. 
if they are, we'll keep going and maybe add something else in, you know, to to put the cherry on the top. Of it. Sounds it sounds like a very common sense way to approach it. Well, um, let's see. I was going to ask you one more question before I have to go uh, in the call with you, and that is, here in Texas, you've been operating under a state of Texas grant to do uh, some special work with veterans to try to get, or, or even some active duty folks, to try to help with their injuries. Is that? Do you anticipate that funding might be renewed, or is that going to dry up, and will you have more difficulty taking care of veterans now? Honestly, that's something at the current time and I can't talk about, but I promise you I'll be in touch with you about it. Okay, good. Yeah, because I'd like to be able to share information. And and certainly, uh, if is there a nonprofit that's associated with Carrick? Yes, there is. Like if somebody wanted to say, hey, I believe in what you're doing. I want to send you 100 bucks. Can they do that? Absolutely. And I will include that in the email with all of our contact information. Great. As soon as I put down the phone. All right. All right, Dr. Shores, well, it's great having you on here. Thank you for everything that you're doing, and uh, I look forward to learning more. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for having me. All right. You have a good day. You as well. Thank you. Uh, let me see here how well of a juggler I really am because I'm going to jump over and I'm going to play this message from Boone Cutler. This is Boone Cutler, author, warfighter, and host of Tipping Point. I want to talk to you for a minute, just one minute, and take the time to listen to what I'm saying. The American warfighter today commits suicide at a rate of 18 per day. That's one every 80 minutes. By the time you finish eating dinner this evening, a warfighter will have committed suicide. This is a tragedy. We're losing the greatest of this generation every day at an alarming rate. Currently on active duty, a warfighter commits suicide one every 36 hours. But there are ways to help, and you should help. You should help right now by contacting gallantview.org and find out how you can contribute and help stop, even eliminate, the warfighter suicide rate. This is a tragedy, and you can help right now by contacting gallantview.org. Do it now. Make it happen. All the way. Gallant Fuse, the new American veteran, is proud to be part of the Vets on Media Network. All right, now I'm going to uh, I'm going to dial up Philip Kitts, bring him on the line here. Hello, Philip Kitts. It looks like a game show. Philip Kitts, are you Philip Kitts? <laughs> I got you. Hey, Philip, Carl Monger, the New American Veteran. We have you live on the air right now. Good to hear you. Hey, thank you for agreeing at the last minute to come on the show. Uh, it's okay. good to hear your voice. Okay. Yeah, so you know we've been talking with uh, Dr. Jacob Shores from the Carrick Brain Centers down here in Dallas, and he's been talking uh, about some of the ways that they diagnose brain injuries and, and the treatment that they do. Um, you have a traumatic brain injury. Can you tell me, how did you get that traumatic brain injury? Um, you know, mine was, was it, it was kind of funny listening to the show from before because, you know, I'm, I'm the classic case of this. I, I went through numerous, numerous blasts, you know, over a long, over a, almost a year period. And uh, towards the tail end of my first deployment, uh, I got hit with a, a extremely large suicide card bomb. And uh, we kind of ranked most of my damage to that. And so it was kind of a compile thing with one big crescendo at the end there that, that damaged the brain almost identical to what you know what he was talking about there in his interview was you know having the balance issues the, the sight issues the ear hearing and all the things that go along with it how well of a job did the, and I don't want to throw stones at anybody but just how well of a job did the system do in diagnosing your injury to the extent of it oh, not hardly at all I mean as I was next in the army it took my wife jumping on desks and screaming at people saying there's something wrong with him. His eye, you know, one of my pupils will extremely dilate for no reason. And my, my wife just screaming at people will say there's something wrong. Well, finally the army took the time to run a couple, just a couple small tests and said, Oh yeah, yeah, you, you better get a TBI. You know, let's, let's put you in, in some treatment. And their consent of treatment was running me through a bunch of tests and everybody agreeing. Yeah, there's a problem, but nothing was done. 
And then as I transitioned out, you know, the VA the problem, but yet they never kind of followed up and it just got stuck in the state of limbo. Meanwhile, I'm telling everybody, you know, I'm, I'm a 30, late 30s male, you know, who was an extreme athletic and, and soldier. And I'm falling over for no apparent reason. And it all came to light, you know, the beginning of this year when I, I could not hardly walk across the firm, falling over. I ended up getting put in the hospital and all of a sudden now it was, it was serious. And we were trying to play catch up over years of damage. And it's, it's, it's life changing. Why do you suppose it is that chain of command, active duty army, doesn't say something's different with you? Maybe you have a traumatic brain injury. Is it because maybe everybody has a traumatic brain injury? It, it's so easy to put that that pinpoint on everybody. And of course, when you when you're a war fighter <laughs> and you're in the battle, you know nobody wants to sit there and go, "Hey, that guy's got a problem," because they're worried about getting you back in the fight. You know? Yeah. Especially if you're you're yeah. a sergeant, staff sergeant, you know, sergeant first class, and you're leading these guys into in the fight every day, you don't want to lose that guy that's been out there and has all that experience. So right. when things start happening and you're like, hey, there's something wrong, it, it's too easy to go turn it the other way. Let's just get him back out on patrol because that's where he needs to be. And, you know, we understand we want to we want to keep like, keeping the fight and keep our best guys out in the front lines, but at what point are we sacrificing? My, I'm a simple case of somebody should have identified that thing, you know, right up front and pulled me off the line, but it was more important to keep me in the fight than it was you know, the human side of the battle. Well, now, from from your perspective, too, as a strong NCO, you didn't want to walk up to somebody and say, I've got a traumatic brain injury, I think I need to go home? No, I'm not going to tell anybody that I have headaches are so bad, I'm on blurred vision. And, you know, you got the two stigmas. We're talking about uh, hundreds of alpha males. You don't admit pain, you don't admit weakness. You're taught that from the day you reach basic training. So there's no way I'm going to walk up to somebody and say, you know, I'm having headaches or I'm having blurred vision or all the gamut of things that go along with the anxiety and you're not going to tell anybody that. You're going to stay in the fight because, one, you feel uh, uh, any pressure to, to be there for your guys and to stand next to your battle buddy when the fight happens. So you don't want to let them down and you don't want to let your chain of command down because these people have invested so much time and effort to help you get to that level where you're leading soldiers. So you got these pressures from all these different directions and as the pressures continue to develop, you don't want to let anybody down. The, the one thing that I won't say everyone's going to tell you is I stayed in the fight because they're my buddies. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So you have you have the macho side of uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm not going to admit weakness. You have the desire to stay in the fight with your buddies. You have uh, a chain of command who wants to keep you in the fight. You have multiple explosions going off that are making the problem worse, and you're fighting. So you can't call a timeout and, and wait for four weeks for, for your brain to reset like the doctor was talking about earlier, you got to go back out there. It's a, just a fact of, of modern combat. Do you think, <clears throat> from your experience, and I know, <coughs> excuse me, as a, as a professional non-commissioned officer, you did a little bit of historical studying. Do you think that the nature of combat now with the prevalence of the IDs and the traumatic brain injuries, is that different than it was in Vietnam, World War II, earlier? Absolutely. The, the, the dynamics are, are extremely different because of the, the constant exposure to, you know, improvised explosive devices is is an everyday effect. You know, I mean, I, I have friends that are that are Vietnam veterans, and I've done nothing but admire a lot of World War II veterans, and, and they saw a large amount of explosive-type injuries that were just never recognized, but it modern day combat, modern day warfare is becoming circulated around this improvised attack device that, you know, it's one very simple, you know, blast. And once they blast you, there may not be a, a firefight involved with it because they don't want to stay and fight. I mean, if you were a foreign country, you're going to want to stand toe to toe with an American soldier. No, I don't know anybody out there that's going to want to, I mean, we're the, we're the baddest in the group. So, you know, what's better than to make a big boom, make a big explosion, and then run away? Yeah, and uh, to make it a little bit more scary, uh, while I was watching the news earlier today, I saw that the FBI's arrested a terrorist that over here in the U.S. that was from Jordan or someplace, and he had been working on a, a little, one of those mini drones that he wanted to put an explosive device and fly in somewhere. You know, that uh, the, the technology and the knowledge transfer of how to implement that technology is at a, a more uh, pervasive point than any time in history. So it, that, that problem, I think, is only going to get worse. But we don't need to go down that path right now. I, I wanted to stay focused on the TBI stuff. And so 
so you, you have all these factors against you, so you have multiple smaller blasts, and then you had a very large blast. And then what was it finally uh, that why did you have to, or how did you move into the medical boarding, medical retirement process? Yeah, I'm, you know, I, I was working with the platoon farm, you know, I loved what I was doing, but like we've been talking about, you know, I was hiding, I was hiding the headaches, the, the dizziness, the little things that, you know, at one point were simple. I mean, you used to be able to tell me, you know, be here this time in this uniform, and, and I was always 10 minutes early, and, and every uniform piece I had was, was spot on. But now, all of a sudden, I had to go the routes of writing down the, the most small, minute details so that I didn't screw something up. And so I'm forgetting, I can't remember, I'm getting lost. I mean, all these little dynamics come, and then, of course, you... Are you still there? You went out on me. Philip, I do not hear you. Do you hear me now? I do now. Got you back. Oh, okay. On my phone. <laughs> like I was saying, you know, when you compile PTSD issues on top of the forgetting the PBI and all these other things, what ends up happening is, is it got to be too much for me. And, and I came home from work one night and I just wanted to lay out. I was looking for an escape and, you know, uh, thank God for my wife and my children who reminded me, you know, I have a bigger mission than just playing on me. So, you know, I started getting treatment, and that's when I realized I wasn't going to be fit for duty anymore. And that's where I'm at now: is continue treatment, continue trying to find a better way to get healthy. And you know, I've, I've got a new fight now, and then that's where I'm at. Yeah, I've been fortunate to spend some time with you, get to know you a little bit, and you remind me of all of the very best platoon sergeants that I ever served with. And and I would have absolutely loved to have had you as a platoon sergeant when I was a second lieutenant, or even when I was a company commander. Um, is your uh, is your missus around there? It, if it's all right, I'd like to throw her on the line for a couple of minutes and ask a couple of questions about her perspective. Uh, absolutely, she's right here. We're running the office. I'm going to pass you off right now. It was great to talk to you, Paul. So thank you. I appreciate you being on the show. Anytime. Hey, Carl. Hi, Heidi. Thanks for being on the show. Well, you're welcome. Uh, tell me. What? Uh, how did you first realize that your husband had a traumatic brain injury and it was serious enough something needed to be done? Okay, so when Philip came home, uh, second deployment, um, we were having dinner and he always kind of sits across the table from me, which is you know quite a distance. And he actually decided to sit to right to the left of me. And just the way the light hit him, he has really, really crystal blue eyes. So, you know, the people kind of stand out. Well, all of a sudden I just looked at him and I noticed that one pupil just completely, I mean, like a pencil and it was that small. It was all blue and no pupil. Hmm. The other one, the pupil had blown so far out, there was no blue in his eye. Wow. And, yeah, it, it scared me. And I had called one of my friends who was actually a medic and I told him what I was what I was seeing. And he said, there's several things that could, this could be. Uh, he goes, I don't want to scare you. He goes, uh, brain tumor could be doing that, an optic nerve tumor. You know, he's going through the whole thing. And he said, has he ever been in a blast? And I said, uh, too many times to count. And he said, it sounds like he has brain damage and it's affecting his eyes. So he goes, does he have a headache? And I said, um, I don't know. Let me ask him. So I go, are you having a headache? He goes, I am now. And that's when we hide it to every time his pupils would dilate like that, a headache would immediately come on. Wow. And from what we're learning is that is the brain trying to, like the, the doctor from uh, Carrick Institute was saying earlier, is the brain tries to overcompensate and tries to reroute. And it, it tries to fix itself, but unless it, if there's a lot of, if you call it a traffic jam, and it can't get around the traffic jam, it, it just keeps running that cycle and being confused and affects other parts of the body and the brain. Well, what our understanding is is the brain just starts swelling. It, it just starts you know, getting crazy and it's misfiring everywhere. And it puts a lot of pressure with, with the eyes that are already not even working correctly. So to bring you up to speed, after all of that, um, we begged the Army to do, to do something. They were like, no, he needs to come back to Iraq. <laughs> so that we, I, I begged them not to put him on the plane. Um, they wouldn't listen to me. And so we had to put him back on the plane, send him back to Iraq. Okay. April, beginning of April, he didn't come home until the end of September. So he dealt with all of that, plus went through more blasts, 
and a mortar round hitting the building. He was sitting up against the wall. Yeah, and, and you have a leader that is um, yeah. trying to lead and take care of other soldiers, and that leader is Absolutely. barely functional himself. You don't talk about putting a bunch of lives at risk. Exactly. So um, with that, when he came back, we you know begged again, hey, you know, can we can we do something? Well, he's a sergeant first class. He, he's got to be in charge, and he can't be taking off time because we're training up to go back again. I mean, yeah. this, this is how the Army was running. And I thought, surely there's another brigade somewhere that's training up that can go that, you know, he, there's got to be another, you know, sergeant first class or a staff sergeant that can be promotable that can step in for him just to let him go down. No, it, it was a, a total fight. So from September when he got home, it was almost October, up until – July of the following year, he, uh, oh my gosh, he was sitting there just struggling every day to go. I mean, we would get up at three o'clock in the morning, we go through our routine, breakfast, drive him to the base, he'd be the first one in, the last one out, so I would drop him off at 5.30 before even the first sergeant or the sergeant major. And now, now you were driving him because he could not drive, or w yeah. were you guys limited to one vehicle? No, what had happened was when he got home, he said, I can't drive. Yeah. And I said, you can't drive. I said, I know you had a driver the whole time you were in Iraq, but come on. And so, I, you know, I kind of lost it off a little bit going, oh, I see how it is. Now, now I, I'm, you know. Yeah, hey, I've, I've had a driver in Iraq. I want a driver back here. I'm, I'm going to have to exactly. keep moving here through this, Heidi, because we're getting a little short on time. But yep. um, so, so he ended up, as you moved through that process, you identified it, and he ended up going into the med process. And and I know you've got a lot of lessons learned about that, but we're going to have to save that part for another day. What I want to talk about real quick are resources for you. Has, yeah. has uh, a spouse of a soldier with a traumatic brain injury, what resources are there out there for you? And maybe you can share a little bit about that. Okay. There's supposed to be a lot of things that are in place for us caregivers. And this is one thing that's on mission for me to try to shorten it for them to uh, speed up the process for caregivers to be taken care of. The problem is, is the VA says, oh, well, we have this and we have group and we have this, that, and the other. Well, if you are taking care of a soldier like I am 24-7, who am I leaving him with to drive 60 miles one way to the peak of the VA to sit with a group of women that probably are just going to complain about their husbands? Because when Philip was in the, in the Army, when I tried to sit down with people during that time, they did the same thing. And I'm, what my goal is is to try to see what resources we can find. But right now what I'm doing is I'm offering my time and assistance that if any caregivers anywhere in the U.S. need to talk to somebody, need some direction on, on what they can do, um, how to reset up their, their lives, their households, um, and, and give them the overhaul of what's going to happen. Um, their soldiers, are, they're not going to come back like the same way that they left. And they're not going to automatically wake up one day and poof, they took a pill or, or whatever, and, and they're 100%. It, it, it's just the reality of it. And your whole life does change. As a, as a caregiver, I've given up my uh, I had given up my career. I had uh, three children, um, aunt plus my husband. And at that, at that, that time when his, um, his setback happened, I actually was taking care of four children because it, it was literally like yeah, he was an sure. infant and had to be retrained. Uh, how does uh, how does somebody get a hold of you if they hear if they hear this and they're a caregiver and uh, they want to get a hold of you? Okay, they can either um, email me at h kits h. How do I want to do this? Hotel, Hotel Kilo India Tango Tango Sierra. Tango Sierra at gallantview dot org, and my phone number is seven eight five three four one two five two three. Heidi, thanks for being on the show and for everything that you're doing. Uh, you've you're taken welcome. on a leadership position that initially was not your choice, but you and your husband are really brave, and, and yep. you're putting yourselves out there. I mean, you just gave out your phone number here for anybody to listen to and call you, and that's, that's not common. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, well, thank you for what you're doing. We're going to do another show where we'll talk about some of those resources and, and some of the other things that you mentioned. So thanks okay. for being on today, Heidi. You're welcome. All right, you. you have a good day. Let's see, I think I have gone through and played all of everything that I need to play so far. So 
Let me do one double check here. I think I had a couple of quick announcements, and then we'll close the show down. Uh, one of the things that I want to remember is the Vets on Media is honored to present inaugural Memorial Day Ride 2014. This is a unique event that furthers the charitable goals of the American Legion Riders Post 34 and Vets on Media. 100% of the net proceeds of the event will go directly to charity. Veteran focused from start to finish. Uh, this uh, event is going to start, this is Memorial Day now, and don't ask me exactly what day that is because I will get it wrong, uh, but the starting point's the Arizona National Guard Military Reservation at Papago Park, 52nd Street, McDowell Road. This is in the Phoenix, Arizona area. You can find out more information about this at vetsonmedia.com, so go check that out. They also have information on their on their Facebook page, and you can get a flyer if you want to share that. It says here, all net proceeds will be shared between Military Assistance Mission, 40%, the National Guard Army Relief Fund, 40%, and the Wounded Heroes Convalescing at the Balboa Naval Hospital from extreme wounds suffered during their deployments. That's 20%. So uh, I'm going to leave you with one last thought for the day because I'm at my hour actually here. I'm glad that I don't get cut off right when I hit the 60-minute mark because uh, that'd just be terrible if I couldn't tell you about this last story. Who is the worst federal agency for hiring veterans? Who do you think in the entire federal agency? Who, who is the worst at hiring veterans? Well, it turns out there's a, an article in Army Times that says that Congress, our elected officials in Washington, D.C., that set the policy for the nation, they are absolutely the worst federal agency for hiring veterans. And, you know, the Washington, D.C. metro area, uh, I believe, has the number one highest veteran population in the United States. So there's lots and lots and lots of veterans that live and work in the D.C. area, and uh, apparently uh, Congress doesn't want to hire them. So, hey, mem members of Congress that are, because I know you all are listening to this program in all your spare time, uh, hire some veterans. Hire some dang veterans and uh, get some common sense in there. And do something about policy on traumatic brain injury. That's uh, subject for another day. All right, well, Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to the New American Veteran, or TNAV for short, on Vets on Media. Please be sure and tune in every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Central and go read gallantview.blogspot.com.